Welcome, pool guys and gals, to the Let's Talk About Pools podcast, where your host, Lauren Broom, will take a splash into many topics in the pool industry to educate all aquatic professionals. Listen in, and you just might be surprised what you'll learn. So let's jump right in. Welcome all my awesome listeners today to the Let's Talk About Pools podcast. And on season two, episode 28, I interviewed Ray Aroesti with Aero Insurance Services. And this episode is going to pertain to how pool service techs can really help protect themselves. Uh, We'll talk about insurance because that's his background as it applies to uh, lawsuits and different situations and his very long experience that will definitely help the pool service tech out. So I really, really encourage you to listen into this episode and take something away from it with you. I've learned a lot listening to Ray. He has a lot of information to give. And today I'd like to thank both of my podcast sponsors. My main podcast sponsor today is Skimmer. So check them out for route uh, management software. And I also want to say thank you to Vito Mariano with Basecrete, my other podcast sponsor today. So let's jump right into this episode and see if you guys can walk away with anything awesome from this episode. And as always... Stay safe and healthy out there in the aquatic world. This is Skimmer, software for the modern pool professional. What can you do with Skimmer? See all your customers on a map, build service routes quickly, and let Skimmer optimize them for you. Access customer information, including contact details and full service history, anytime and anywhere. Customize work orders to track jobs like repairs and filter cleanings. Email your customers when you complete a service. You can include service details and on-site photos. Does your customer need a part? Add it to the shopping list and track it from purchase to installation. Skimmer will even remind you what parts you need for the day, and you can mark them as installed right when you're finished. Skimmer doesn't just store your service history. It helps you get paid. We integrate with QuickBooks Online for fast, easy invoicing. And we've got more billing options coming soon. All that's just the beginning. Go to GetSkimmer.com to watch our demo video, check out our online tutorials, and see if Skimmer is right for you. Welcome, everybody, today to the Let's Talk About Pools podcast. And my episode guest today is Ray Aroesti with uh, Hub International slash Aero Insurance. He's the Senior Vice President. Welcome today, Ray. Well, thank you, Lauren. It's good to be here. I really wanted to interview you. I think this is going to be a great episode for the listeners. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, claims, insurance, and things pool techs need to be thinking about when it comes to liability. Am I correct? Well, that sounds, yes, you are correct. It sounds great. You know, for the past three or four decades, I flew around the country doing talks like this at, at uh, trade shows, swimming pool trade shows. And since COVID, uh, I'm not too anxious to go to those pool shows anymore. So I welcome this opportunity to do this virtually and get get my message out. I, I, it's a great message. You and I have talked many a times, um, interviewed you for a lot of my articles, and I've learned a lot from you in this topic. So I'm looking forward to bringing your perspectives and you're very well known. Um, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your experience, because it's very mind blowing. Your experience. Well, my experience is kind of diverse. I'll say that for 40 years, um, I had a company called Arrow Insurance Service, and um, I sold that company to Hub International five years ago. Hub International is the largest independently owned insurance brokerage in the United States. It's a multinational company with over 10,000 employees, and I'm a senior vice president of that company. I was licensed to practice law in the state of California in 1990, and I was a litigator for 15 years um, over that 31-year period. Along the way, I managed to get a California contractor's license for swimming pool repair, (laughs) and I I held that for about 10 years. And uh, in between all of that, I spent 15 years as a commercial avocado grower and producer, which was just kind of a... uh, a business hobby of mine. So I've seen, uh, I've seen a lot of pool claims. I've seen a lot of litigation. 
I've seen a lot of contractor issues and even uh, concerns when it comes to agricultural concerns as well. So uh, that's, that's a pretty very, much what I've been very, doing in my uh, life. That's a very varied background, even the avocado. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that until just now. That's very cool. So uh, we've talked about your title and your background. I, I knew that that was going to just, you know, bring everybody in. Ooh, got to listen to this uh, person um, because you got so much experience being the, the, the litigation side, being a lawyer, you were a pool contractor, like a lot of these listeners are going to be pool tech. So it's really, you're relevant to them wanted them to make sure they knew you're relevant, you understand their industry, but you also cover uh, some entities in insurance too, correct? Well, Arrow Insurance is a division of Hub and we are exclusively involved in the swimming pool industry. Um, I got started in the industry in 1982 when three swimming pool service techs came into my office and they explained to me that they wanted insurance on a group basis for about, about 100 guys. Uh, that, was a, that was a group called Calypsa in those days. And I was impressed with that group because they had something called a sick route plan. And they explained to me that they were all sole proprietors and they all had a similar concern. That concern was that if one of them was hurt or in an accident, they would lose their entire route. They could be doing 50 pools and everything would be doing great. But while they were laying in the hospital, their pools uh, would go to someplace else. They would go to another pool service company because, at least in Southern California, pools turn green in about 10 days if they're not being serviced. Mm -hmm. So I liked that idea. Uh, that appealed to me. And uh, I agreed that I would work and try to get them some group insurance program. And I spent about six months doing that. And uh, I did put something together. Uh, I did insure Calypsa for about six years, and then Calypsa merged with another association, and that became the Independent Pool and Spa Service Association in 1988. I became the uh, exclusive insurance provider for IPSA in 1982. That's, that's about 40 years right now. Ooh, I'm, also, I'm also the, insur uh, the exclusive insurance provider for the Swimming Pool Association of Hawaii and uh, the National Plasters Council as well. That's a big remodelers. That's a big Every, Everything my team does at HUB is swimming pools. And over that time, I've handled about 3,000 pool related claims against service technicians, builders, and remodelers. So I kind of laugh. Um, I kind of laugh sometimes thinking that I'm an expert in this field but I'm an expert in how to do things wrong because every claim I take is uh, more often than not the result of a service tech doing something wrong. So if you want to know how to do it wrong, ask me. <laughs> That's an interesting way to think about it, Ray. You are an expert in doing things right by comparison. <laughs> so we <laughs> compliment each other on this uh, podcast very well yeah, today, right? They're, they're different sides of the same coin. So you said 3,000 claims. Um, what kinds of claims have you been involved with in that 3,000 claims? Well, you know, I've seen it all from plaster issues, spalling, etching, modeling, um, all the way up to wrongful death claims. Uh, we've had claims for house fires. Um, I had a $5 million house burned down and Beverly Hills, because a heater was improperly installed. I could talk a long time about that. I had claims for carbon monoxide poisoning when pool heaters had been incorrectly installed, uh, installed and with violations of the city and county code, put under bedroom windows. Uh, as I said, plaster damage. I've had hillside collapses. I've had floods, mudslides. I even had a claim that uh, at Frank Sinatra's old house, where a swimming pool tech overflowed a spa on a balcony, flooded out the room where Frank Sinatra's piano was sitting, and we almost had a claim for damage to Frank Sinatra's piano. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, Barbara Sinatra came home, saw the water damage, and called the water, um, the water removal company, and we, we dodged a big one there. 
but um, that would have been an expensive one. That would have been an expense. I, I've had some very big claims. What about like recreational water illness type claims or anything like that? Well, fortunately, I have not had a, um, a crypto sporidium case. Everybody in the industry is so concerned with crypto, uh, but I have had claims for staphylococcus and uh, folliculitis, swimmer's ear, E. coli, and um, legionnaires as well. I, I sometimes joke when I'm giving a lecture and um, I, I've said more than once in public that I think there is a requirement when you go to med school to add, if there is a bacterial illness or fungal issue with a patient, I think med students are taught to ask the, the um, patient if they were in a swimming pool because they seem to focus on swimming pools. And I had one claim, for example, where a woman presented to her doctor with, uh, with staphylococcus on her leg. And uh, the doctor asked if, he had sh if she had been in a hot tub or spa, I'm sure enough she had. And uh, he concluded that the staphylococcus was the result of poor water maintenance. Inter it was interesting because the staph was was limited to the area between her knee and her ankle. And a lay person like me, I think most people would have thought, gee, why the staphylococcus only on the front of her shin? Why wouldn't it have been all over her body? Well, we got a claim um, alleging that the pool tech was negligent for improper water maintenance. And uh, in the deposition, we discovered that um, her roommate also had staphylococcus and that these two women shared a razor and they shaved, shaved their legs with the same razor and one contracted the staph somewhere, gave it to the plaintiff in my case, who was suing the pool tech, the same razor, passed the staphylococcus to her. And, um, but sure enough, they went to the pool tech and for years I had a blog called blame it on pool tech. <laughs> and that just seems to be the, um, the thing we do. But we, you saved that full tech at that day. point in time, right? I beg your pardon? You say, he got saved in that one because you guys yes. kind of figured it out in the deposition. And once and once we found job. out the women once we found out the women shared a razor, we were dismissed from that. Correct. That's good. Um, let's a little bit about more like I know we're seeing more Legionnaires disease and that kind of thing. So any specific example that you could give um, that you handled with Legionnaires? Uh, yes. And I'm going to be talking maybe a little later on about, uh, uh, about the specific problem with Legionnaires. I think, I think I'd rather defer that till the end of what I'm talking about okay. because Legionnaires is a real specific problem. And, um, what I'm going to say today doesn't involve Legionnaires. Um, uh, but I want to touch back on that at the end. Gotcha. So what are the most common type of claims from pool techs that you get? Well, the most frustrating one I've had over the past 40 years has been overfilling of pools and spas. You know, I, uh, I understand we all have a lot in there on our minds, but it is such a common claim when a pool tech is filling a pool that he drives away and forgets to turn off the hose bib. And um, I, 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 I still can't figure it out. We could have five inches of rain here where I am today, and there wouldn't be a lot of home flooding. But when a, when a garden hose is left in a pool, for some reason, the water runs into the house. And we get tremendous damage from overfills uh, in swimming pools. We get damage to, to carpeting and padding. And then in a warm environment, mold, Stachybotrys chartarum is the mold that's the most common we see that starts growing within 24 hours and you have mold remediation that's necessary. We have damaged furniture. This furniture is made of pressed sawdust frequently and it's a, you have to throw it away because you can't salvage it. We get the mold growing on plasterboard. So you've got to cut out the drywall and you've got to spray the inside of the walls and take out the insulation. Um, I had one, I had a $400,000 claim on an overfill where the water that overfilled the uh, pool uh, damaged the foundation of the house and the house sank. 
and they had to put piers underneath. It was a $400,000 claim. Or sometimes you have the overfilled water goes over a hillside and that creates a landslide. I had one claim where that happened and then it started raining. And this mud from my client's job site ran down the hill into a neighbor's yard and clogged her deck drains. And then it started raining and the water from the rain couldn't drain through the neighbor's clogged deck drains because they were all covered with mud and her house flooded. So oh, we, we, just see, we just effect. see so many claims with water damage and there's, so, there's such an easy way to prevent this. And first of all, I don't know how much water you can add in 15 minutes when you're at a job site. But if you have to add water, I've been recommending for years that service techs leave their keys on the hose bib. Get a carabiner. Years ago, I even made a carabiner, which said, hang them on the hose bib. We called it a water loss prevention tool. People <laughs> would call up and they'd ask, how do I get the water loss prevention tools? Um, but it was basically a carabiner. Put a carabiner on your truck keys, hang them on the hose bib. Serves two purposes. You won't be able to drive away from the job site, leaving the water running and your truck won't get stolen uh, by you leaving the keys in the ignition. So um, especially especially for the techs that have employees, I would have a serious conversation on a weekly basis about overfills. They're totally preventable. So that that really is, I think, my most common claim and the most easily prevented. Um, the second would be plaster claims. Plaster claims are more difficult because to my way of thinking, plaster starts to deteriorate as soon as you put water in the pool. And that's one reason I have a tile pool. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that given that my client is the National Plasters Council, but um, we do see a lot of claims for plaster and there's a controversy in the industry as to what the fault of that is, whether it's the mix or the aggressive water, or I don't want to get into that because it's a very uh, political discussion. But one thing I want to talk about when it comes to plaster damage, which kind of breaks my heart, is when a service tech, a good natured service tech takes over a new account, uh, particularly in an old pool, and he services the pool for a year or so. And then the customer says, you've damaged my plaster. It's stained, it's etched, it just looks bad. And who's your insurance company? And then I get the call from my service tech who uh, tells me that the pool was in bad shape to begin with. And I ask him, well, do you, did you document that in any way, shape or form? And he said, no. And then we have an uphill battle trying to establish a timeline when there's been no documentation as to progressive and continuing damage. It's really frustrating from my sitting in my chair because my job is to defend the pool tech. And when I don't have a paper trail or documentation, it's, um, it's like I'm shooting blanks out of a rifle. I, I, I can't do anything. So I recommend to pool techs taking on new accounts that they establish the nature of that pool, particularly the plaster, before they ever start servicing it. And it doesn't have to be really formal. They can take a, a sheet of paper and they can draw out a kidney bean shape if that's the way the pool looks. And in the areas where they see damage, put some dots and in the air, like for delamination, put some dots. And in the areas where they see copper staining, put some X's. And on the bottom, just put down the, the dots and put down the delamination, the X's, the copper staining, and establish what the pool looks like at the time. You don't even have to take a picture. Draw a line at the bottom, date it, and ask the customer to initial it. Now, 18 months later, when the customer goes to the pool tech, claiming that the pool tech damaged the pool, ruined the plaster, all he's got to do is say, hey, Mrs. Pool Owner. Mr. Pool Owner, <laughs> remember when I was here 18 months ago, we talked about the condition of the pool and you see these dots and X's that were here at the time before I started servicing the pool and the claim goes away. Now, I, I don't think people are generally uh, nefarious or cheaters or liars, but 
memories fade, particularly when you've had a pool for many, many years. It's kind of difficult to establish the date when the pool started going uh, bad, particularly because it happens slowly. And I think that's one great way a service tech can protect themselves by using that new pool evaluation checklist or diagram, call it what you will. And uh, again, it's ammunition. If I have that, my life is easy and I can get pool guys out of claims. So yes, the most common kinds of claims, water damage, super easy to prevent if it's an overfill um, and plaster damage. So what have the, been the worst type of claims that you've handled, Ray? Right. Well, fortunately, the worst claims I get are not the most common. They're the most rare, but they are um, really significant. And the one that comes to mind was a claim I had last year uh, for an entrapment drowning. And this was a heartbreaking case where a service tech maintained a pool, a residential pool. I'm sorry, it was a residential spa. Even worse. He serviced that spa for two years and the spa was missing the main drain cover. Oh. He was there every week. He saw that cover and uh, he told me that he didn't think the owner would spend the money to replace the cover. So he continued servicing that spa week after week after week. They had five kids living in the home. And one day, um, a seven-year-old went down there to explore that uncovered main drain, put his hand down there, and uh, the equipment was running at the time. His hand got lodged in the main drain, and uh, the other kids couldn't pull him off. The mother came out. She couldn't pull him off. And they all watched the boy drown. And um, the family filed a lawsuit against uh, the pool tech, among, uh, along with others. And the theory of liability was that the pool tech was the expert out there. He knew better than anybody else who was in that backyard what the danger, uh, what the danger was of a, of a spa with a missing drain cover. You know, pool techs hold themselves out to be professionals. And a homeowner can easily say they, re they rely on the expertise of the swimming pool service technician to make recommendations like this. In fact, what's more important? What is what is more important in the uh, in the job description of a service technician than to keep people safe? Yeah, they they do that with chemicals, with sanitizer, and and uh, keeping the pH in check. And a main drain, we all know, represents such a hazard. So the fact that that technician didn't warn, didn't drop the account, continued to service the account made it extremely difficult for us. And it was a whopping big payout that um, resulted from a tragic, tragic situation. So, uh, and it's not the first one I've had. Um, the other ones were pre-SVRS pre days and pre-Virginia Green Baker Pool Safety Act days, you know, the uh, VGBA only applied to public pools, but it really set a bar. It raised the standard for all pools. So uh, I'm asked sometimes about uh, my feelings about extending the Virginia Grand Baker Pool Safety Act to residential pools. I really don't think we need it because all residential pools today are being built, as far as I know, to the standards um, that the VGBA would require if it did apply to residential pools, there isn't a residential pool today built with a single main drain. Um, so there you go. Uh, the entrapments are clearly the worst. When it, when it um, came to that entrapment that you talked about, that particular situation, what should the pool tech have uh, done? Well, number one, you start easy. You start with a conversation with the homeowner and you tell them, you explain to them the extreme hazard that's presented uh, as a result of the missing drain cover, and you insist that it has to be replaced. Um, I'm often asked, what do I do? How do I document? And uh, what, what if the customer doesn't want to? 
So I, I divide hazards really into two categories. There are the little things that it would be nice to fix, um, maybe a drip um, from the equipment. It should be fixed, but it's probably not going to kill anybody. My, my rule for all these years has been as follows. If you've got a situation that can foreseeably lead to serious property damage, injury, or death, those hazards have to be corrected. There is no ifs, ands, and buts. There's no waiver. There's no release. There's no sign off. If the homeowner, if the pool owner will not fix those items that can foreseeably lead to those significant property damage, death, or injury, the pool tech has to drop the account. That is an account he cannot stay with. Now, as I lecture around the country, as I used to lecture around the country, someone will raise their hand right now and say, how do I let the customer know? Do I have to tell them? And the answer is yes. Uh, years ago, I had a pool tech who dropped an account that had an electrical issue. He thought there was an electric shock hazard at the pool and the customer would not pay to fix the problem. So he dropped the account. And six months later, there was an electrocution at the pool and he was sued six months after he dropped the account. And the pool owner claimed that they had no idea why he dropped the account, that he had an obligation to inform them when he was servicing the account of the dangerous condition, and he failed to do so. And if he had told them about it, they would have fixed it. And the child who died in the pool would be alive then, would, would not have been shocked. So if a pool tech runs across that situation where that hazard is so great, and he has to drop the account, I recommend um, putting it in writing. It doesn't have to be written by a lawyer. It can be simple English. Mrs. Jones, after all these years, I regret I have to drop the, your account. I have to drop your pool because there's a big safety hazard. And that hazard is your electrical is bad or a missing main drain cover. Um, and this could lead to someone dying in your pool. Uh, I suggest you fix this right away. And you send that letter or something like that letter certified to the customer and you keep a copy of it forever because that is your uh, get out of jail card. Um, but that's, that's what you've got to do if you come across a hazard that is so extreme. I had another big case. Um, well, right. Hard. Even sending it certified mail would be a good idea, right? So that you know that somebody got it. Absolutely. Yes. Certified mail. Um, I had another, I, I had a death in Texas, uh, on a carbon monoxide situation where a service tech was maintaining a pool and they had a heater in an enclosed room without a stack to the outside. Oh, wow. They just had a flat grate and they had some windows that they had open and they, I guess, thought that those open windows provided adequate ventilation for the carbon monoxide. I can't imagine why any service tech would go in that room to maintain that equipment, given that there was no operational stack for the carbon monoxide, but, um, but he did. And a 26 year old girl on the other side of the wall, one morning they found dead. And apparently the carbon monoxide weeped through underneath the wall, many, many homes, are built with something called a weep screen. It's, a, it's an area at the bottom of the wall. If you look underneath with a mirror, you can see like, a, like um, a grate and it allows moisture to get out of the area between the walls where the insulation is. Apparently the carbon monoxide wafted up through that area, got into the house and uh, they found an extremely high level of carbon monoxide in the dead woman's uh, blood. Of course, lawsuit was filed there. Settlement was made. Um, the, third, the third most serious claims that I get are, are drowning, non-entrapment drownings. And these, boy, these are tough. I'm thinking about another one in Texas where this was just a, a ratty pool. Um, they didn't have adequate safety 
devices. There was no shepherd's hook. There was no signage. There was no telephone at this pool as required by code so that if there was a problem, someone could call uh, 911 to get uh, first responders there. There was no rope float between the shallow end and the deep end. There was no fence around the adult pool. There was a kiddie pool, but there was easy access where the kids could move between kiddie pool and adult pool. But what they really hung their hat on when this uh, child drowned was they found the depth markers were inaccurately marked. In the area that said four feet, the pool actually measured four and a half feet. And their argument to the court was that if that depth marker showed four and a half feet, the true depth of the pool, the child would not have gone to four and a half feet, which was above her head. I want to say thank you to Vitu Mariano for being a podcast sponsor today of the Let's Talk About Pools podcast. Please check him out for flexible, waterproof bond coating. He knows everything about concrete. So definitely check him out and see what his product is all about. Now, um, lawsuits are very expensive. Um, I'm often asked, why do you settle cases? You know, it can easily cost a quarter of a million dollars to take a case to trial. And if it's a complex case, considerably more than that. And even if you do take a case to trial, there, uh, there's no guarantee you're going to win, particularly on a case that involves drowning or uh, injury of a child. Um, they're very, very sympathetic cases. And so because of that, because of the cost involved with litigation and the uncertainty of the results of the, uh, the outcome of the litigation, companies uh, consider consider a settlement. And this, this drowning case uh, in, in the public pool in Texas was settled. But the reason I bring it up is the obligation on a pool tech to, to make sure that's a safe environment. What's, what I think too many pool techs think is that their job is confined to the area between the coping, the water skim the surface, they vacuum the bottom, they brush, they maintain proper water chemistry, and occasionally they backwash the filter or clean the filter. And they think that is their job. And they come in and they do it and they leave. Because in my mind, in their mind, they have satisfied all the elements of the job that they're being paid for. Yep. Most often the service techs do not work with a service agreement. Now, here's a problem. There's often a disconnect between what the pool owner thinks the service technician's duty is and what the pool tech thinks his duty is. Pool tech thinks it's maintaining safe water. Pool owner thinks it's keeping the pool area safe. After all, who else knows more about the pool area than the pool tech? <laughs> so you get a situation where the pool tech comes in and he sees these hazards. Maybe he sees toys around the equipment area, or maybe he goes, when he's going to look at the equipment to backwash the filter, he sees that there's an, an improperly um, installed heater underneath a bedroom window. He thinks, well, I didn't install the equipment. It's not my job. My job is to maintain the clean water. But you assume that, somebody else's that, problem, right? It's almost you like assume, you assume it. You assume the negligence of others by through your silence. Mm -hmm. The pool tech in most states has an obligation to warn of danger and hazards. So when he sees that pool heater that is under the bedroom window and improperly vented, he does have an obligation to tell the customer of this and to fix it or leave the job. Um, or if the pool if the pool heater is too close to a fence that could cause a fire and um, burn down the house perhaps and injure people he's he's got that obligation so um, I think that's the way pool techs can best avoid some of these claim situations and it's a recognition that their job is broader than just simply maintaining water it's keeping that pool area safe and um, 
I know in my lectures, that's the big thing I try to stress. This is, this is really important for service techs that have employees. Um, I can talk to the pool owner and, you know, he gets it. But you've got often a different mentality with the service techs. Uh, they're employees that are going out to these job sites. Yep. So, um, you know, those safety meetings that many states require, we call them tailgate meetings, a Tuesday morning tailgate meeting with a cup of coffee. And <laughs> yep. these, are the kind of, these are the kind of things the owners should be talking to their employees about. Employers have a very, very important interest in doing this. Their employees are often the weakest link between their financial security and losing it all. Um, many, many service techs operate as sole proprietors. They're not incorporated, which means that all their personal assets are on the line. Yeah, they buy insurance. I, 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 I offer wonderful insurance, but Sometimes insurance isn't enough. If you've got a wrongful death, like um, in the uh, Palm Springs area a few years ago, there was a bad light in a residential pool. And there were seven, six kids in the pool. And the father was standing on the deck and he saw one of the children that was the closest to the light shaking from electric shock. He jumped between the, the girl and the light. and He was killed from electric shock. So you, you take a case like that, an income earner, and is, 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 say he's 40 years old. The man's got 25 years of earnings, and maybe he's earning $100,000 a year. Uh, do the math. It's $2.5 million, I think, off the top of my head. Um, that's just in the loss of earnings component. Now you've got the uh, loss of society and the emotional value. And um, my goodness, yeah, I mean... Exactly. You talk millions and millions of dollars. And even if you have a good insurance policy that covers you up to a million, um, you still have personal assets at risk. And when you've got employees that can do things and overlook hazards, these are the kind of things that would keep me awake at night. Well, and there's so, so many guys out there, like even when I'm in the face, some of the groups, social media groups and that kind of thing, they kind of scoff at some of the things like, we don't need more of anything like OSHA training or anything like that. We, we handle our chemicals. Okay. There's no, it's fine in the back of my truck, the way I'm driving around with it. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of haphazard setups where they're driving around with all these hazardous chemicals on their trucks and one in case car is stacked very high above the yep. Sides of the bed, of course. A car accident you know, I, waiting to happen or, you know, anything. So there's certain things that it'd be really nice for the industry to switch into. It's not being regulated. They always, they think when they hear like OSHA 10 or something, it's regulation. It's no, it's training. It's education. We're not saying regulate you for it. We're not going to go call. OSHA is not going to come out. They only come out for complaints usually so if you don't get any complaints what the it needs to go toward the training aspect of it even on that end because they're driving around they put the community at risk when they're driving around and they don't really care about doing it properly do you agree ray i absolutely do and you know i've i've always thought of my job my job is to let business owners, small business owners succeed. I'm just an element that gives them the opportunity to have a wonderful retirement someday. Mm -hmm. And for those service techs that run uh, bigger companies, companies that have employees, I think it's imperative that either they or a trusted manager go around to every pool on their account on a regular basis. Maybe it's once a month to eyeball those pools, because I, I just don't think you can depend on an employee to, to have the eyes, the broad eyes, and the wherewithal and knowledge to recognize what hazards are out there that could come back and, cre and, and create a, a dangerous situation resulting in injury or death or a house that burns down where the business owner can be held responsible. 
The yep. business owner or a trusted manager has to eyeball those pools regularly. Gee, that's probably why one of the big reasons why public pools are regulated and then they get their random checks from the local regulatory authority so that somebody's eyeballing. And you, usually that inspector is looking for health and safety, which is what we've been talking about here. But private- and that does not happen at a residential pool. Correct. I was about to say majority of customers uh, that our listeners are going to have are going to be residential customers and there is no regulatory authority at that point. So they've got to care about what they're doing and be educated and do the right thing and do a good job. So I know we are putting off to the end a little bit. You know me, I love that recreational water illness thing. And I really think Legionnaire's disease is very interesting. So if we could talk a little bit about Legionnaire's with like a hot tub or a a spa, give us an example of a claim or anything you've had with that. Legionnaire's is, is a beast all of its own. Um, with so many of these water, waterborne diseases, whether it be Staphylococcus or E. coli, um, the skin provides protection. And as long as we don't have an open wound, we're pretty safe going in water that has minimal levels of chlorine. Uh, by the way, I'm, I was told by a microbiologist in the industry that it takes only 0.6 ppm in most cases to kill all these wet, nasty things that can hurt you. 0.6. It's a minimal level of chlorine, but the skin provides pretty, a, a, a pretty good barrier as well. Legionnaires is different. Legionnaires is transmitted um, through mist and it's through, uh, through the respiratory system. So we inhale the Legionella bacteria through our noses and mouths. And because it's transmitted, uh, aer- aerosolized is the term, it's transmitted as a mist, you get this uh, very often in hot tubs. I had a claim where 18 people uh, stated that they got Legionella uh, two years ago. It was a whopping big claim. Um, and the pool, it was a, there were over 20 people in this small, small spa. Um, there was not a controller on the, on the spa. So with, and, and most insurance companies don't cover Legionnaire's disease because the damages can be so great. So the pool, the pool tech is kind of on his own when it comes to, it comes to Legionella claims. And what that means is that the pool tech has to plan for failure. And I think in so many of the cases I have, that's the key. You've got to plan what's going to happen if something goes wrong. If the feeder stops working and you've got 18 or 20 people in a small spa, what's going to happen? We don't want to conclude, I'm going to go bankrupt. That's, that's not acceptable. That's not a good answer. No, that's not. So we have to plan for failure. And what I recommend is, on these commercial spas that are getting heavily used, I think there should be a secondary sanitation system. I think a secondary backup system like UV or ozone would be a great idea. In many communities, they are not going to be permissible as the primary sanitation device, but as a backup, if the primary fails, my goodness, what a, what a good insurance policy to have. I totally agree agree with you on that a hundred percent. I know a lot, um, I know a lot of regulatory codes require that kind of setup like on splash pads, but they haven't really added it to their regulatory codes for commercial public spas yet. So that's an interesting piece right there. We could talk and go on. One of the, one of the problems, Lauren, is that a lot of the techs are really not um, comfortable talking before a, uh, a, a residential homeowners association or the board of directors of a large complex. They, it's just not their thing. They don't like doing it. But if someone was willing to go in front of the board and explain to them that 
we are putting, you are putting your financial assets are at, at risk if this one device fails. And we should plan for failure. We should plan for failure by having a, having a secondary source. And um, I, I guess if I have to sum up everything I've been talking about today, um, what I would, how I would mentor a, a service tech from the legal and insurance point of view, it would be think broadly. Your job is, goes beyond the water. You are the one who's entrusted with the safety of that pool area. So start thinking that way. If you have employees, not only train them properly, but get a manager or yourself and go around and make sure that you don't have super hazardous conditions out there, like a missing main drain cover, because you will be held responsible for those. Um, if you're taking on new pools, make a little diagram of the existing damage so you don't get blamed for the, the previous guy's uh, problems. And, third, and finally, plan for failure. Things break. It seems like they break far more often now than they used to. And what's going to happen if they break? You can't have people die if a piece of machinery breaks. I, so, always, I always say be proactive instead of reactive when it comes to things like that. Well, I certainly agree with that. And, and also document, document, document. It's, it's just like when you work somewhere and you're having an issue with a boss, you're always told, get a nice little notebook and you document the date, the time, what they said, because if you go to HR, they're going to want documentation. So if you do well, it in something like that. Well, I'll, give you, I'll give you one better, Warren. I'll give you one better. I spoke to a gentleman who had uh, developed an app. Everybody carries around a cell phone. And um, pool guys don't carry around notebooks regularly, but there are apps out there now that if you see something out there when you're at the pool, you can take a picture, you can document it, you can press a button, you can email it to your pool owner, and there's a paper trail that's in the cloud and it's never going away. And that's exactly the kind of ammunition that I want and need to provide a vigorous defense to keep, uh, to keep a pool tech in business. Yep. Emails, emails, a good uh, track record because they can be pulled up. Any good computer person can bring something up, even if it's deleted. It's still there somewhere. There you go. <laughs> so document, 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 pay attention, do a good job. And, and basically, be, yeah, be proactive instead of reactive so that you're fits in things before you actually wait. Oh, it, it's going to break eventually. You know, it's just like doing oil changes on your car. So I thank you so much for being on today, Ray. Well, thank you. Thanks for diving in today with the Let's Talk About Pools podcast. Be sure to follow us on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. And feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts so more aquatic professionals like you can learn about the show. We appreciate it. And we'll catch you in the next episode of the Let's Talk About Pools podcast.